This is Carbon Mike. In Foundationism, we have three archetypes, the forge, the library, and the tower. The forge represents the spirit of the builder, the tradesman, the craftsman, the person who creates things for a living. The library represents the spirit of the researcher, the historian, the scholar. And the tower represents the search for higher meaning, the contemplation of religion, and the moral law. We believe that to be a balanced human being and to have a balanced human society, you need to strive for balance between those three elements, those three archetypes. Not enough of the forge spirit means that although your knowledge is sound, you lack the ability and the discipline to apply that knowledge correctly in the world. Not enough of the library spirit means that although you may do great things in the world, you will lack historical understanding and you won't be recording your knowledge for posterity. And not enough of the tower spirit means that you will make your way in a bleak, materialistic landscape without knowing why you do what you do, without a sense of meaning and moral purpose. Late in 2021, shortly after Christmas, I sat down with a fellow member of the Foundationist Society, a UK-based carpenter and cabinet maker named Philip Riggle. We had a long and very satisfying conversation on a variety of topics, politics, culture, current events, religion. But most importantly, we talked about his journey and his life as a maker of things in the spirit of the forge. Here's part one. Phil, thanks for talking to me, man. Uh, where in the UK are you from? Um, yeah, hi, Mike. Uh, I'm in Falmouth in Cornwall. I was born in Southampton. I uh, moved down here when I was a child. Uh, my mother's from Falmouth and my father's from Hampshire. Um, but I spent most of my life here. I did a 10-year stint in Southampton where I learned my craft. And, yeah, then I moved back in 2003 and been here since. Yeah. Now, so th this is... Uh... This is the Falmouth Cornwall. This is the south, uh, the, the most southwesterly part of England, correct? Of the island. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, it's about a 40, 45-minute drive to the end of England, to Land's End. When you were a kid growing up, did you, did you always like building things? Were you one of those kids that kind of took your toys apart and put them back together and things like that? What was your... Um, yeah, well, there's a little photo on my website which incidentally hasn't been updated for about three years. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's not my thing. But um, of me at the age of five making a gate in inverted commas for the, uh, for the, for the entrance to our place, um, I re actually remember making that. Um, and probably as an eight, nine-year-old, I, I made a couple of skate ramps, um, which were, in retrospect, pretty good. I obviously had a bit of a gifting or something you know um, cool. I just kind of understood what to do I suppose right. and um, but it, it wasn't something that was in my field of vision um, I loved the practical side of, um, of craft lessons at school which was at the time was called CDT craft design and technology mm. um, but <laughs> maybe this is something we could talk about later but a, a pronounced failure of the education system. Um, I, for instance, we would be given a project to do an egg cut, an egg holder, or something like that. There would be six or seven weeks of design process, and you had to, you would have to come up with four or five different designs and work on those designs and all of that. Whereas, which I found incredibly frustrating and boring, mm. because. I saw in my head what I wanted to make, and I just wanted to get on and make it. Right. Um, and that's kind of come out in my work now. I, with, with the pieces you'll see on the website, I, I see it in my head, and then the process of um, I have to then overcome the obstacles and work out the problems in order to fulfill that vision. Mm. Whereas maybe an artist who paints pictures, they don't have the final vision. I'm not sure. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe maybe they have to go and then see what the final piece is. Whereas I am very much, I can see it in my head. Yeah. And 
it's just a question of getting from A to B then, really. You know, what's, what's interesting about this, yeah, I, I definitely wanted to to touch on this in, in the conversation because you and I are kind of in the same place in terms of uh, understanding that the education system is really failing people, really failing, especially yeah. failing young people, young men in particular, who have this this uh, sense of how to build things. Um, you know, there's, you know, you, you're not supposed to, yes, drawings are important. Yes, sketching things out, things out is important, but... You know, it, it, it's, I think that sounds like a curriculum designed by people who don't actually build things for a living and don't really know how it is. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah. so that's interesting. Well, it's, it's a good thing that it didn't put you off carpentry in general. That, that's, no, no, no. Well, know, that's it, it didn't. It took until the age of 21 um, before I started my apprenticeship, maybe 20 uh, 97, 96, 21, yeah. Um, I was um, a bit of a down and out, I'll be perfectly honest. Um, after after my conversion, uh, after becoming a Christian, um, I had nine months of being really on fire. Um, I went to get baptized. To cut a long story short, they didn't want to baptize me for whatever reason which sent me on a spiral of depression for a couple of years. Um, I, I went to London and did a philosophy degree, um, got kicked off of that after a few months because I didn't attend lectures. Um, came home to Falmouth. As soon as I set, got uh, set foot in Falmouth, I, I hitched. <laughs> I hitched. I got a train to Plymouth because that's the only money I had. I hitched from Plymouth to Falmouth. And um, as soon as I got in, got home, I had to leave. Went to Southampton. Spent nine months on the dole, sleeping in till two o'clock in the afternoon. This is not good. Ended up going back to church, recommitting my life to Christ. And then um, opportunities came up, and I had an opportunity to uh, work on, to start an apprenticeship on uh, STS Tenacious, Sail Training Ship Tenacious, for the Jubilee Sailing Trust, which actually, as it happens, is the largest wooden tool ship to be built in Britain in the last 120 years, Whoa. which I loved. I, oh, my word. Just fascinating. What's, so fascinating. So wait a minute. Wait a minute. Your internship as a carpenter was essentially with a shipwright. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. I, I did yacht and boat building at college. Yeah. But I used to, um, at college, we had to have college one day a week and the other four days were on building a ship. Um, I used to be very envious of the cabinet makers at college um, and I did request if I could transfer but because the ship build was four or five years um, they were like we don't need any cabinets for like four years so they didn't let me change my course so I <clears throat> uh, met Nikki in the meantime this is probably about the third year of my apprenticeship now um, Nikki fell pregnant immediately, <laughs> pretty much within a month or something. And um, so I'm a third year apprentice at the age of 23 or something with a baby on the way. And um, and I asked for a pay rise and they said no. And I, I left after doing three, four years. But I deliberately went to a joinery shop and to do bench joinery because that was really where I, what I wanted to do. Mm. And um, yeah, and that was that. Yeah. Wow, that's that's pretty amazing. Now, now was it, what strikes me about uh, you know what you'd said so far is that um, you know there there's a well you didn't always get you didn't always get the kind of encouragement that that people have uh, conditioned young people to expect, right? But but you you mm -hmm. kind of persevered. Did your parents were your parents encouraging? Um, of your... um, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, they were 200 miles away at this point. Yeah. Um, but I know my dad was very, uh, very proud of me for being on this apprenticeship. Yeah. Um, the, people would take the mickey out of me on the job because my auntie was um, was the director of the Jubilee Sailing Trust, right? <laughs> Literally, 
as God is my witness, she didn't even know I was applying for the apprenticeship. She had nothing to do with that side right. of things. And I, I got on, you know. Yeah. Um, and do you know what, actually? I I got on. I Did I get a job? I really, I, I applied for the apprenticeship. Mm-hmm. I got in there, but there was already four youngsters, and I was the fifth because I was 21, and but they really wanted the 16-year-olds to get it. So they said, well, if you kind of like do handyman stuff, if anybody drops out, which they usually do, you can take their full apprenticeship. And one guy, he was too busy smoking dope or something, you know, and he, within a couple of months he left, and, and I got that place. But um, it, it was... I've got very fond memories of that time. Just such a fascinating thing to to witness and be part of, you know. Right. Um, yeah, but I mean, after my apprenticeship and when it, going to a joinery shop, which was very traditional doors, windows, um, which the first job I got at PJ Cabinets um, was an orangery window. I didn't even know what an orangery was, Mike. <laughs> it was flipping huge, man. Wow. You know? Yeah, just knock that together, please. You know? <laughs> I'm flipping. I had no idea what I was doing. I think probably by one o'clock that day, I was quiet. I was, my eyes were watering. I was in tears. I don't know what to do. Right. But um, I got there somehow. Wow. And then that kind of set a pattern, really, um, of, I never, I've never been anywhere more than two years. I've, I'm now self-employed for eight years, which yeah. is the longest I've ever done. Yeah. Other than my apprenticeship, always two years. Go somewhere else, mm-hmm. stretch yourself. Right. Um, I've got a cousin, and he started an, an electrician's apprentice. He's about ten years younger than me. And I was saying, Jamie, as soon as you finished your apprenticeship, leave and go somewhere else. Okay, mm-hmm. stretch yourself. Yeah. And I, I've been in, I went from PJ Cabinets to Southampton Yacht Services, which is very high end. Um, I, after three weeks, this must have been divine intervention, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I was on the boat. I didn't want to, I'm not interested in fiberglass. Um, I don't get on with it. I have a few skin problems. Um, broke my wrist. Uh, they put me in the joinery shop, which is where I wanted to be. And I stayed there. And it, I learned a lot of, learned so much about finesse there. Um, it's amazing how many I've been worked in a lot of places and it's quite interesting how many woodworkers don't really understand finesse because there there is so much in that Um, just knocking the edges off knocking the sharp edges off finishing nicely yeah yeah, yeah. just transform can transform a piece of work just by knowing just by taking your time and those little things that you can't really teach as such, you know, it's something you have to kind of get there for yourself. But I'm a firm believer in being stretched and being out of your comfort zone because you grow into it. Right. And once you grow into it, you get wiser in your work. And, um, yeah. Yeah. And then then it's time, I get, and then it's time to, to, you know, once you found your comfort zone, then it's time to get out of it, which means oh, you know, yeah, stretching yeah, yeah. that. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, that makes total sense. Totally. By the way, for anyone listening to this, uh, you all should go to Philip Riggle, R I G G A L L dot com, and see some of the work there. Um, you know, the first time, you know, when, when I. Uh, when I got a notification that uh, uh, that you were you, you were one of my uh, Twitter followers, I do this. I try to do this uh, whenever I get a new uh, uh, Twitter follow. Is I go and, and click on the person's thing and 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 kind of see their avatar. And sometimes they'll have a website link as you do, and mm. you know uh, that's always exciting because I'm like, ah, this person does some other thing, you know. And then I go and I click on this thing, and it's like I see this. Oh, whoa, I got to talk to this dude, <laughs> you know. Oh. Um, because it's really, you know, the, um, and I want to get back a little bit to your history, but I just, I just, uh, you know, we, and we can get into this too. I mean, I think part of the spiritual malaise that is affecting any kind of your, your society and mine, and that has mm-hmm. been for a while, um, you know, one of the, one of the symptoms of this, I think, is a kind of an alienation from beauty, from beauty as such, from the important. We mm. haven't lost beauty; we've just been alienated from it. 
right? And we've yeah. and we've been kind of. It seems like it's, the, the the people among us uh, who do art for a living are the most guilty of this. You know, you mentioned artists mm. earlier, right? And yeah. you know, I'm really I'm really sick of artists, and I'm really enamored of craftsmen. <laughs> you know, mm. I think. I think it, it, we we might have a better art establishment if we had uh, less less art and more craftsmanship. Uh, mm. You know, hundreds of years ago, people uh, if if you were a painter, it meant that you had to grind your own pigments, you had to mix your own mm. paints, you had to stretch your own canvases, you had to make your own frames, you had to maybe, maybe yeah. had to make your own brushes, what have you, and then you, you then you could actually kind of go about you know. Uh, mixing colors and 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 putting brush to canvas and what, but you had to. In other words, yeah. you had to know your stuff, you know. Yeah. And, and I think the element of craft really grounds you. Do you know what I'm saying? Like you're gonna build a bench unless you're some artist who's already established, who's got more money than sense. There's no buying a lot of exotic wood and putting a lot of time into tooling and machining and all this stuff just to build some expressionist non bench. That looks like it yeah. came from the, you know, from the mind of a French <laughs> postmodernist. You better build something that's right. You know what I'm talking about, yeah. right? Yeah, and, yeah. and so this, you know, I, I really like the thing of, of 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 people putting their hands on the world and making things that are practical and making things that are that are of value to other people. Making, you know, you make a chair, someone wants to sit yeah. on it. I'm looking at this yeah. this stool that looks like. Um, it, it almost looks like uh, uh, what they call a tori, like a spirit gate. Um, a Japanese spirit yeah, yeah, gate, yeah, yeah, you know the you know the stool it was you made. Based on that. It oh, was based on that. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. That was that was the inspiration. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that got snapped up. That I did a couple of exhibitions, um, which have all now been wrapped up mm -hmm. because of because of the blessed lockdowns mm -hmm. and all this nonsense that we're suffering. Um, but yeah, I did a couple of exhibitions, and um, those benches were. Yeah, they they yeah they got snapped up. Yeah, people like them. Okay. <laughs> Rightly so. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, so so you know the, one of the things that strikes me as I hear you talking about this is is that, um, and this is something I tell people a lot is that that you know sometimes you feel a calling, sometimes you feel a passion, an urge to go and do something, but very often once you get into it, what you find is that you're going to get to a point where you sit there and you go, man, this is terrible, this sucks, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and, and you have to push past that. And I, I say that not to say that it's bad to, you know, follow that calling, but just to say that as a counterbalance to young people always being told to, to follow your passion, there's a sense in which discipline and commitment is what sustains you when passion may fail or when, do you know oh, what I'm saying? Absolutely. And, it's, and yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so totally. you, know, you talked about yeah. the first thing you did, but making a door or a window for an orangery. What were some of the low points that you had to push past or push through in terms of, um, you know? There was quite a few at that place. Mm. Um, bearing in mind I was... Uh, you know, only in my fourth year, um, just just to rewind a smidge. Um, in in the second year of my apprenticeship, I was given the task of um, putting shelves <clears throat> in between the frames. So this ship was 68 meters long. Mm. Um, the frames were laminated larch, okay. 22 laminates of nine mil each, epoxy resin bonded. So it, so there were 220 wide <laughs> it's funny how these figures stay in your head uh -huh. um so you had it you had the bunks built in and i had to my job was to build all of the shelves throughout the ship okay. um, behind each bunk so three shelves per bunk about 40 odd bunks whatever and um flip the first week i was struggling you know what the heck i'm not getting this because you've got the shape of the ship coming down the curve right. so you've got that bevel You've got the straight um, plum side of the frame, right? And but you've also got as the as the frames go around the ship, the angle right. the angle changes with every frame to the center line of the boat, right? So it's, got, it's got a compound. It's got a compound curve on it, you know. Yeah, yeah, with, completely. If, if you're yeah, going like to mate with the side of three, yeah. four ways. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So I, I'm I'm really struggling with this, wow. you know. And I was, they left me to my own devices, which is great mm -hmm. in retrospect, you know. Nobody held my hand or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I was just here's your job, crack on. Wow. And um, 
yeah, so I'm suffering for a bit of a week, not getting it at all. And I had a light bulb moment. Mm. Everything became clear. Wow. Oh, my word. I was sailing after that, pardon the pun. You know, <laughs> I, it was... Um, so, yeah. Um, then I went to PJ Cabinets, had the orangery and the doors and struggling for a little bit. Um, one one job I had was doing the sill for a bay window. Mm very big radius five meter radius or something um and i had i was i had to cut the angles on the sill so it was in eight sections or something like that a big curved bay window and um (laughs) i'm feeling really proud of myself and um you know i got there and then ali the boss comes down phil you've cut the sill the wrong way around oh you know Oh, so, so the the rake of the sill <laughs> facing indoors, you know. Facing in rain. I, oh, oh! I was so proud of myself as well, and um, I was flipping out. I'm so sorry. I'm so please take it out my wages and oh, don't be daft. You know, it's probably yeah. 500 quid's worth of timber. You know, yeah. Yeah. so um, yeah, uh, lots of times like that. Yeah. There's um somebody I saw saying not long ago. Um, the master has failed more times than the novice has even tried. Yes, you know? yes. And it's, it's learning from your failures is the big one. That's right. Um, I, I still make the occasional blooper, you know. Sure. I still cock up very occasionally. Sure. But it's, it is remarkably less than it used to be. Yes. You know, it's, it's very rare now. That I'll, um, I mean, looking back, I think in my learning process, probably one of the biggest mistakes people make is wanting to get to the end product before you've actually exhausted the correct, the correct protocol, the correct way, what modes of doing things, you know. You cannot rush those steps. That's right. And it's so many mistakes come from, oh, I just want to get to the end. I want to get to the end, you know. And and you, and by the time you, and when you make that mistake, it costs you. It's painful, and you have to feel that pain. Yes. In order to learn from it. That's right. You know. So yeah, right. like you say, you know, speaking to youngsters out here, they they might look at my Trinity lectern. Oh man, yeah, I'd love to make stuff like that. Yeah, cool. I. Go, make one, go for it. You know, right, right. have have a have a blast. You know, but it's um, I don't know. It's you're going to go through. There, there are painful stages you have to do. You have to and go You just it. have to embrace them, That's and you correct. have to do them. And I still get that now. Yeah. You know, I still have processes on jobs, which are tedious, but it's having. I want to get to the end. I need to. I need the finished product. Mm-hmm. I know enough now not to skip stages, right. not to rush, because it just costs more time in the long run. Yes, you know? yes. Well, you know, I mean, this this is a kind of, this is exactly what I'm always going on about. It's like, the, the these are the types of disciplines that, you know, even if, I mean, I know you and I are already on the same page in terms of way too many young people being encouraged to go to college instead of perhaps pursuing the trades. It's a tragedy. It's a actually, tragedy. It's a, it, it's, a, it's a monumental waste of human talent, first of all. Yeah. And people coming out of there precisely because th- they're almost divorced from that cycle that you talked about, that humbling cycle of, okay, I have something in mind, I want to do something, I have an idea, right? Now I'm going to test that idea against reality, right? I have to test that idea against what the materials are capable of, what my tools are capable of, and what I'm capable of. And getting slapped down by that process and that pain you feel when it's like, oh, the thing didn't work out or I made a mistake or I cut corners here or whatever, that's a necessary part of learning, no matter what you intend to do in your life, I think. Um, something just come to mind. Um, mm. I had my first staircase <clears throat> this year, um, this summer. Um, it was external. It had a winder in it, um, so a dog leg. So you got one, two, three, four, kick around, one, two, three, four, and then up a straight flight. And um, 
I didn't want it, I'll be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I, I did try turning it down. You know, I'm really busy. I, I was busy. Yeah. But um, And they said, oh, we need it done by June. Mm-hmm. I said, oh, I, I won't be able to do it till August. And um, so I said, I will wait to work. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't, right? couldn't get rid of them. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> oh, we really want you to do it. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I'll have a go. Yeah. And um, at PJ Cabinets, that first place I went to after my apprenticeship, um, I routed out a lot of stairs. Yes. But the guy did all the marking, and he was a absolute whiz. You know, he, he did it with his eyes shut, practically. Yeah. Yeah. And um, but so I just routed out the housings for the for the treads and what have you. I I didn't understand the process of measuring and making stairs. But anyway, by it, I allowed a week for this staircase. It's fairly straightforward, to be honest. But um, oh my word, I just couldn't see it. You know. Yes. Yes. I, I was, I'd drawn it out um, to scale, um, done all of that by the Wednesday, and I had a young, I had a young chap with me. He's he's about a year out of his apprenticeship, just helping with the quantity of work we had to do, yeah. and um, just I'm struggling it. I'm genuinely struggling because I cannot, I can't see in my head how is, how this works. Yes, you know, but um. By way of testimony, actually, um, the next morning we got in, and he's not a Christian or anything, but um, I said, first things first, Ed, we're going to pray, okay? And I read from James, uh, the, James's letter. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given him. But when you ask, believe and not doubt because the youth dances like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed forth by the wind. Right. So first things first, I prayed that God would give me wisdom. Literally, Mike, that day, by midday, bang, light bulb, I've got it. Wow. You know? Yeah. Chuffed to bits. The, the client was chuffed to bits. It went great, and we got it done in the week, you know? But that's happened too many times to count. Yeah. I have many times on jobs. Um, the, the table... Um, the rainbow table, mm-hmm. my word, that took, took a lot of working out and a, a, a fair dose of pain, actually, because I could see what I wanted to make. I knew it was possible. <sighs> now it's just getting from A to B. Yes. What's the, what are the processes I need to do? I have to suss this out. I like being stretched. I like being tested. But I've got a, I've got a background of an apprenticeship where you learn these disciplinary things um, it's tough, you know. I, I feel for youngsters um, who who've been brought through this education system. Yeah. You know, I I don't have a lot of time for it now, Mike. I um recently in the recycling was Julia, who you spoke to recently, mm-hmm. was one of her science books from year seven. Okay. And it was in the recycling, and I thought you can't throw this away, like the old, you know, thinking about my childhood and finding finding your old school books in the attic, you know, it was quite touching, you know? Yes. Well, you can't throw away one of her books. You know, then I started looking through it, and I just... Why a, a, why can't we have a tailored education system? Because Julia is not interested in this stuff. Mm. None of it. Mm. Most of the maths, you know... The only thing I would recommend in maths, unless you are a mathematician and you want to go deep, and maths is great, you know. Yeah. I personally don't get um, uh, trigonometry and all of that kind of stuff, you know. I never really got it. But the only thing I would teach personally is by the end of your schooling, you are going to be hot on mental arithmetic. Yes. You know, you're going to add stuff up in your head, bang, fast. That, that's basically all you need in life, really. Yeah, everything <laughs> else, everything else is really gravy. But although I would say, I would say, keep in mind, you said, see, I, I think even the way, of course, the way we teach mathematics is mostly wrong. But I would go further than that. I would say most people, the, part of the problem with that is it's similar to the problem you talked about having when you did what was it called, C C D T. Um, Mm-hmm. crafting uh, yeah. uh, right it, w- what we call yeah. shop class which was that yeah, yeah. too much focus on the theoretical 
not enough yeah. focus on the practical and on the uh, on the intuitive because in my way of thinking mathematics is the study of patterns that's what mathematics yeah. is and yeah, you yeah. say you say you don't get trigonometry well i would beg to differ did did you just build a staircase or not yeah yeah right I, right, right i, I mean what, trying, what is I, I don't think trigonometry was the right word what what am i thinking of where you have x y equals z What's oh uh, that was algebra uh, yeah re- right yeah still to this day if you ask me to write an equation i i wouldn't really know where to start to be honest with you no trigonometry was the wrong word because i work with angles right all the time, all the time. and every carpenter <laughs> works with that but i would but but again yeah, yeah. here's the thing i'd still beg to differ because you say you don't know get algebra no that's the fault so much the worse for the way they teach algebra because here's the thing you you ha- i know you have in your craft uh because all of us do it who make things uh kind mm. of figured out um what kind of what what a given ratio is or should be for a given kind mm-hmm. of part or a given kind of joint or a given kind of assembly and yeah, then yeah. and then translated that ratio to the amount of right. material you actually had and the size right. of the thing that you actually had to be right okay. so you've done you've done a form of mental algebra did you necessarily use equations x you know someone the, the guy who taught me all about um about amplifiers one of the most brilliant design engineers I have ever met and he was self-taught and he said don't sweat he, he knew that I was doing a lot of self-teaching myself and I was buying books and I was banging my head against a bunch of stuff and I was complaining to him that you know some of these equations that they didn't they didn't take enough time to explain how the equations related to things and he said don't don't worry about equations don't worry about the you know x y whatever he said you know equations are useful when you want to know a specific quantity yeah. Otherwise, skip that shit and move on, you know. So all, the, all that by way of saying that, you know, th- there's all this, th- you know, to your point about a tailored education system, you know, mm-hmm. we pre- precisely because we're trying to operate this thing at such a scale, right, we have to almost run roughshod over the many kind of individual differences and quirks of the way people learn, which is like their fingerprints, you know, they're, they're, the kids are different. And and it, I think it, it may be likely that, that this, the whole way, we have to rethink the whole thing, okay? Because it's like may, maybe this, an education system is really not supposed to operate at a scale like we try to operate our education systems. As, because, because you're always going to have to simplify human beings beyond what the facts of humanity will bear. And, and, and the, yeah. the upshot of that is that you end up ignoring how people learn things intuitively, visually, um, aesthetically, you know, by putting their hands on things, you know, maybe you're going to make a model out of, out of popsicle sticks or out of toothpicks or or bamboo skewers and, or you're going to sketch it or you're going to do whatever. And, and people Mm. acquire a feel for these things, but the ability to do math is in us, right? Because, because mathematics is, 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 is the cousin of reason, reason, comes from outside the world, right? It's it's our gift. It's the mm. maker's mark on us. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was reminded of, um, remember an article years ago by some professor of mathematics or yeah. astrophysics or whatever, and he, um, and he broke down <clears throat> a goal scored by Wayne Rooney. Mm. I don't know if you've heard of Wayne Rooney, but he's kind of... Apart from being a great footballer, and I'm not so interested in the football much yeah. these days, yeah. but um, a soccer player, for yeah. those listening in America, um, <clears throat> he broke down his goal into mathematical equations. And <laughs> like <laughs> basically saying this guy is a genius. To be able to kick the ball from there to the top corner of the goal there mm. requires an understanding of flight patterns and x y and z you know i think it's quite interesting so yeah the intuitive nature of learning so yeah i i wouldn't know how to write down an equation i wouldn't know how to break down what i'm making right on paper you know because I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of fag packet drawings you know yes. i, I like Right. This is the basics. Right. Let's just get on let's and make it. You know, it. I, I don't need to. De- I don't need to design every aspect of it. You know, right. I like to learn on the fly. And oh, is this going to work? No, there's too tight a curve. 
to bend around, so I'll have to make that piece out of a solid piece of timber, you know, whatever. Right, yeah. right, right. It's more of an intuitive thing, yeah. yeah. Well, it, you know, it strikes me that, that many of the... Um uh, m- many of the most interesting things that we've developed in, in our societies, yours and mine, over the last couple hundred years have been developed by people who were not, I mean, they were professional in the sense they got paid for their work, but they hadn't been professionalized, right? I mean, uh, you're a UK guy. You you almost certainly know about Isambard Kingdom Brunel, okay? Oh, I mean... We only <sighs> talked about Brunel this morning. Oh, man. My dad and... Two brothers were playing snook, and my dad studied Brunel as oh, a wow. as a young engineer. Right, he was, right, he was right. in the merchant navy, the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, and um, and we ended up talking about Brunel. Now we've got a bridge, um, the Tamar Bridge, yep. which um, separates Cornwall and Devon. Um, yeah, an amazing guy, yeah, amazing guy, just an amazing. There, there was a <clears throat> what I think of when I think of Brunel. You know, apart from his genius, um, was <clears throat> what seeing a documentary on him and, and how his wife and children never saw him, you know, yeah. and that is the downside to that to Yes. To having a single minded focus on um on a on a project, you know. Yes, that's right. But I don't know, what do you do? Um yeah. I doubt I think Dad was making the point about the railways. Um when we were building our railways in Britain, Brunel pushed very hard for a five foot gauge. For that gauge, right. Yeah. Right. But the the people who were paying for it know we want a four foot seven gauge. I think it was a difference of five inches or something. But I and I think to this day the Americans use a five foot gauge. I might be wrong on that. But he was proved right. Yes. The five foot gauge was better than the four foot seven. Yeah, interesting. That that goes to show what happens when the eggheads uh you know, <laughs> and the bean and the bean counters, you know, decide to overrule yeah. the the guys with their hands on the on the work, you know. Um, but you know, this is yeah. It, this guy was not he wasn't a quote unquote professional engineer, and that he wasn't he hadn't been certified by some board, right? You know, yeah. he hadn't he hadn't gone to school for for ten years. Um, you yeah. know, after after high school, for example, just to mm. get some degree or whatever. And this guy built things that are still standing today. How long ago? Yeah. How long ago did, did he yeah. live? Right. And that's not the only example. I mean, I can think of. Um, I was talking to someone else about building and our obsession with metrics and measuring people and certifying things and certifying people. And I pointed out that, for example, in the United States, we had uh, a month or two ago, I believe. A collapse of a building it was a partial building collapse and they had to demolish it in Florida this was a condominium that was that was found to have very many structural defects and there was all kinds of stuff going on and there was water leaking and what have you and 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 things reached a crisis point and there was a partial collapse a bunch of people lost their lives and then they had to demolish it right now I looked into the history of this building this building was less than 50 years old it had been built less than 50 years years ago in a state right where the climate is such that the temperature never goes below the freezing point of water right and you know you and i both know that water is the enemy of structures especially when it freezes right okay mm-hmm. now by contrast right christopher wren designed the church of uh, saint mary le beau in cheapside mm-hmm. london centuries ago yeah and it's still standing St. Yeah. Paul's uh, Cathedral, right? Another Christopher mm-hmm. Wren design, right? Still mm-hmm. standing. Centuries, yeah. okay? You know, in yeah. in miserable, <laughs> rainy, cold, freezing, yeah, yeah. whatever, London, right? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so, you know, we're really, we're really missing out, I think, on, on, um, on a huge amount of human talent. Part of that, I think, has to do with you know, the things you talk about, how we teach and how we emphasize certain things. We emphasize, you know, this kind of dry way of, okay, you're going to draw a million diagrams first. You're never going to put your hands on. And no one to, you know, if you taught painting like this, right? If if you taught Mm -hmm. people painting by just saying, okay, we're going to just talk about color theory for six weeks. Yeah. Before before you ever touch a brush. No no No. one want to be a painter. Come on. No. You know? So, yeah. Yeah. um, there was some, I mean, touching on the the climate emergency in inverted commas narrative, 
um, this is something that's been bugging me for a while. Mm. Um, <clears throat> apart from the obvious, the only solution that the governments of the world are pushing for is control and totalitarianism. Yes. You know, you're not allowed to drive your car and blah, blah, blah. And how far we're going to go down that road is becoming increasingly clear. Mm. But um, why aren't... Um, take my diesel van, for instance. It's nine years old. Mm -hmm. The emissions are... It, you could basically, because of the diesel particulate filter... Yes. Um, and... I mean, a reasonably modern engine. Mm -hmm. You could basically stick your face in front of the exhaust pipe. Correct. And breathe quite safely for an hour, you know? I wouldn't recommend it. Right, but, but you could do it. The, so why why aren't the... Why isn't our government, just to focus on the UK, why aren't they encouraging those young people... Right. Right, guys. Um, a, a, a diesel engine at the moment runs at... I don't know what the efficiency... How, how efficient does a diesel engine burn fuel? I don't know. 62%? Whatever the figure is, I don't know. Somebody will know who's listening. Mm -hmm. um, right. The mission is to get fuel burning efficiency to 70%. Right. That's the goal. And in the meantime, with that other 30% that isn't being burned, we that is going to go through a series of filters so that what comes out of the exhaust pipe... Is fresh air. That's an engine. There's an engineering problem. Engine. I see this now. 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 Now we're talking, right? Because yeah. this is this is the thing I'm complaining about all the time, which is that we have a generation of people who, precisely because they've been steered away from craft, they've been deprived of the um, of that mental discipline that craft imposes on mm. you that yeah. the only way they can conceive of problems and of course uh, you know I, I don't I don't concede that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is this huge problem that everyone uh, says no, I don't either. Uh, but let let's concede that for a moment okay yeah even conceding that we have a whole generation of people who can't see that as anything other than some moral crisis instead of a mere engineering problem. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? And, and yeah. cats like you and me are like, yeah. well, okay, if, 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 that's an, if you have an engineering problem, we'll solve the engineering problem. Again, do some, yeah. do some back of the envelope calculations. You know, yeah. what is this? Other than, and then, okay, well, let's get a game plan together and let's go. And, and this, yeah. is one, this is one reason, by the way, you notice you never see, you never see climate strikes outside of trade schools, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You never see guys, you never see guys studying to be carpenters or welders or, or gas fitters or steam fitters or plumbers or whatever. Mm. You never see them, you know, on strike and all up in their feelings about this and that and so-and-so's yeah. lives matter and the, the world is burning. You never see them doing this. And by the yeah. way, I've never seen a climate strike outside an agricultural college. That's interesting because yeah, yeah. we have them in yeah. the U.S. You probably have them over there too. Who would stand to get hurt the absolute worst and and before everyone else if the climate really collapsed? It's farmers, obviously. All the farmers will go broke and starve to death first if there's a real climate collapse. How come they're not freaking out? Oh, maybe maybe no one's talking to the farmers because they're too much like actual craftsmen, right? If you've talked to farmers, you know, uh, you know, talk to any given farmer, and that guy is a, he, aside from being an actual farmer, he's a carpenter, he's a welder, he's a plumber, he's a veterinarian, he's a shade tree mechanic. I mean, that's how farmers are, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, As it happens, Mike, uh, my landlords, um, are, my workshop is on a farm. Oh, cool. There's four or five of us up there. Um, oh, most of us are woodworkers. And our landlords are two brothers. They're farmers. That's beautiful. So it's a working farm. Um, they've they've got a herd of uh, Herefordshire Reds, I think they're called. Oh, cattle. yeah, yeah, yeah. And this, these guys, this is what bothers me about um, the vegan stuff and all yes. of that. Yes. These guys, they, work, they get up early. They take a lot of care of these cows. It costs them a lot of money. Yeah, the drugs when a cow is fallen yeah, ill sick, or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, they take, they move them from field to field. These cows feed on beautiful grass. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys care. Yes. And I remember Matt, um, one of them years ago, saying, um, "If we down tools, 
there will be riots within a week. Correct. Correct. Right across the country. Correct. You know, and I thought, wow, what an interesting thing to say. You know, yeah. and yet the farmers are getting to stick in the press. Right. You know, now they're now they're attacking the meat, yes. and I, I believe that's because of the Great Reset agenda. You will eat less meat. Um, it's, it's deliberate. They're attacking the farmers. Now, what the heck? These people are on the ground, and they know what it means to raise a cattle from calf to full grown. You know. And it involves a lot of hard work. Well, they know what it means to feed an entire country. I mean, that's the thing. The the, the yeah. core of these guys, right? It's like they're feeding, they're feeding everybody. You know. Yeah. And and again, th- this is this is why I say the fundamental problem is is that we have uh, we have a class of elites who don't understand things fundamentally. They yeah. don't understand how things are made, how things come about, how energy is yeah. produced. I was, I, I had a little, uh, <laughs> I went into a little um, rage on Twitter <laughs> some some weeks ago uh, when I read something about y- your transportation secretary, uh, Grant, uh, what's his face? Uh, Grant Shapps, I think his name is. Uh, you know, I read something from his office about hydrogen powered aircraft. And again, because I, because you know, because I geek out about this stuff, and because I know something about aviation and and engines and things like that, I did some back of the envelope, and it's like, that's the most ridiculous idea I've ever heard. It makes no sense whatsoever, none, yeah. zero. And you could again, you could do some simple, you could scrawl a couple of calculations on the back of an envelope and realize this doesn't work, you know. So yeah. like, you know, and and these people lack the basic, and you know, again. No excuses, man, because, you know, going after your transportation secretary isn't my job. I'm an amateur in that sense, right? You know, he's a professional. He has a staff. He has people who can do research for him. How come no one cleared this idea? You know, <laughs> n- no, in the right, no one no one gave this thing the smell test. You say, listen, man, come on. How are you going to store all that hydrogen? How are you going to whatever? What's the energy density? What's the power density of the, of the power plant? How are you going to retool? Yeah. How you Come on. You know, and again, we need this. This is the kind of thing that, that I'm, I'm not a big... As you know, and I'm conservative, I'm radical, but I'm not revolutionary, right? So mm. I don't believe in burning everything down. I don't believe right. necessarily that, you know, that, that that's a lefty kind of thing. Oh, let's just hit reset and start again. No, but yeah. we need a class of, we need a leadership class that is not, that, that, that does not come from inside the bubble. We need to start seeding leaders who come from, the ground level, meaning who come from this, the, the tradition of putting your hands on the world and trying to make things work. Because yeah. once you've done that, it doesn't mean, of course, you know, it doesn't mean working class people are right about everything. It doesn't mean that just because you know how to do this, you have your opinions are always valid about something else. But it means that making things and having to make something that works, right? And having to make something that works and you give it to someone, they have to use it and has to provide value to them. It provides you a discipline. Right. It, it disciplines yeah. your mind, disciplines your soul. And you have an obligation to build things well. You know, and, and, and when you make things, you're responsible. You're responsible, you know, and and, yeah. and, and we, we don't have a leadership class like that in your country or mine. And, and, and until we until we figure that out, we fix that. We're going to be in, in dire straits, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Who's the um, American chap? He's a he's a dude. Mike Rowe, is it? Oh yeah, Mike Rowe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dirty he jobs. Me as a, yeah, a sound guy. Yeah, and, yeah. and trying to encourage people to get to college. You know, for, oh, yeah. uh, to get to um, learn a trade. You know? That's right. That's right. Yeah, he springs to mind. But um, does he get much airtime over there? Or? He get well. See, I, I don't watch. I don't watch kind of broadcast television, so I don't know how much airtime mm. he gets these days. I know that he, he at one time he ha- he did have a show on cable called Dirty Dirty America's Dirtiest Jobs or. Dirty yeah, Jobs yeah, with Mike okay. Rowe. He has a, uh, I know he's got a scholarship going for trade school, which I think is great. Um, he's got a program mm. called Mike Rowe Works, you know, same kind of thing. Yeah. And he can be seen occasionally on this or that uh, news uh, network just saying, talking about the need for people to uh, to get in there and study, you know, uh, uh, to become skilled machinists, tool and die people, carpenters, welders, so on and so forth. I love that guy. And there's another guy... Um, 
There's, there's an author named Matthew Crawford who wrote a book called Shop Class as Soul Craft, because what you guys mm -hmm. call C, uh, CDT or crafting something technology, yeah, yeah. we call it uh, Shop Class, right? Um, yeah. Or Industrial Arts, we used to call it Industrial Arts. And he wrote a book called Shop Class as Soul Craft, same principle, this is good for you. The, you know, working with the, working with the world, working with physical things, even if you don't go into it as a profession, it's good for you. It's good mm -hmm. for your soul. It's good for your mind. Absolutely. You know, it, it trains your intuition. It's good. And then, um, and then I, I don't want to uh, forget to plug my buddy Andrew Mon, who's a, a foundationist as well. He just published a book called "Don't Go to University." Um, <laughs> which is, it's awesome. That's what it says on the tin. I like it. Yeah, yeah. and actually, we, we, he and I did a he and I did a, a podcast talk about it a little while ago. Uh, and you know, his, his thing is: listen, you're being sold this bill of goods. It's called university. If you want to do something that requires you to have university, that's one thing. But if you're just going because that's where you're supposed to go, then you know, stop and think. <laughs> you know. Yeah. 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 Interestingly, my um, my daughter Louisa is just she's twenty three. She's just started a degree in theology. Um, you can you can learn something like that anywhere else. Yes. You have to go to university. Yeah. But she was aware at the beginning that she's going to come across ideology. Yes. And and I was um, you know I was kind of encouraging her, look look into who's where does Exeter University get its money from? Right. You know, for instance, right. have they received anything from Bill and Melinda Gates, for instance, or or whatever? Anyway, she's two, three months in now. She loves her Greek class. She loves. She does Spanish as well, um, as well as the theology side. But the biblical side, she's starting to skip lectures. Now she loves her Bible, right? She's a faithful Christian. Um, but she's starting to miss the occasional lecture mm. because the module every week it's a complete deconstruction, right? Uh, the deconstructionists again, mind, Jesus. Yeah. I, I don't. I know, I know my daughter and myself included. I'm happy to talk about anything under the sun. Sure. But if your goal is just to deconstruct. For the sake of deconstruction, in fact, it's not so much deconstruction; it's demolition. Yes, correct. Thank right. you. It's um, that's that's the only goal, and she's just kind of, I'm just getting sick of it now. Yeah, yeah. I don't even want to go to the lecture because I know that I'm just going to hear them slagging off. Right. You know, never mind the fact that there are there are sincere scholars who spend literally fifty years. Right. trying to get to the bottom of the Bible yes. and don't even scratch the surface, you know? And yet, lo and behold, in three years, you can not only understand the Bible, but you can dismiss it you as... You can deconstruct it, right, right. ...as patriarchal nonsense. Well, this is, I mean... <laughs> you know? Yes, yes. And, and here, here's the thing. This is something that... Uh, that uh, we know we need to do a better job of seeing through, right? In other words, we shouldn't be surprised that um, that people who want a shortcut resort to uh, uh, deconstruction, which you know, to my way of thinking, is just what well, just just call it just call it destruction, <laughs> because you, you're not yeah, actually you yeah. know yeah. deconstruction. That's like that's almost like um that's like calling shoplifting. Uh, you know, uh, uh, grocery liberation. <laughs> it's like, no, I didn't. I didn't shoplift that. Yeah. I didn't shoplift that food. I liberated it from its. You yeah, know. yeah, yeah. No, you're destroying yeah. things, and you know something. Yeah, destroying things is easy. Surprise, surprise. Yes, turns out that it's easier to. And you and I know this. Everyone who has made anything knows this. That it's mm. very much easier to destroy something that has been built. Sure. Yeah. You know, and and yeah. this is this is the thing too. It's like our educational system is chock full of people who learned, quote unquote, learned in this way. Yeah. And they learn these techniques and these tactics, you know, the deconstruction or what have you. And those people and their ideas are poison. I mean, that's my yeah. opinion. They are poison. Yeah, yeah. It's actually, um, it's, it's a betrayal yes, of um, time-tested methods, um, time-tested learning. It is a yeah, it's a yeah. betrayal and yes. love. You know. And so and so I think I think the um the, the challenge I think in the next 
few years. I mean, you've heard me talk about this stuff before. I happen to think we're in a war. Um, yeah. I, I think we're in a very long war. It's just it's just gotten started recently. It's going to last at least a century. Um, and we can win. We can win, but we have to first acknowledge that we're at war, know who's making war on us, and we have to tool up, and we have to team up, and we have to get it on and get on with it. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's what we've got to yeah, do. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, no, no passive thinking, no, what is the government going to do next? Let's assume they're going to do the worst possible thing next. Because you know something? When you're at war, that's what the enemy will tend to do.